Well, starting now, Scott, ready? Yep. Hello. Um, today we have with us Tom Rowinski. He's a friend of mine, um, and we happen to grow up in the same town in central Massachusetts. Um, Tom is presently the Charles Bullard Fellow in Forest Research at Harvard Forest, where his focus is in white-tailed deer overabundance. He studied at University of Massachusetts and has a master's degree at Cornell University. And his career path began in 1982 with the Nature Conservancy, followed by positions with the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation, the Massachusetts Audubon Society, and most recently with the USDA Forest Service. Um, he has written scores of technical reports and publications and helped protect important natural areas throughout the Northeast. Awards include the New England Wild uh, Flower Society's Conservation Award and the New England Society of American Foresters 2014 Integrity and Conservation Award. Tom is very proud of his son Peter, who is a fisheries biologist working in Cortland, New York. Um, Tom lives in Oakham, Massachusetts, um, where I used to spend a lot of my youth um, with my father in that section of the state uh, running through the woods. And Tom is an excellent botanist and deals with rare and endangered species and is a very outspoken. And I think you will enjoy his presentation today. Um, I should mention we had a little bit of connection issues, so um, Tom's going to be on his phone through the computer speaker, so you might have to turn up your volume a little bit. All right. All right. Thank you, Scott. There must be something in the water and grass in Massachusetts. <laughs> that we ended up kind of in similar um, professions. Hey, I'm really happy to have this invite from the Connecticut Ag Station. Um, I'll be talking about what I consider the greatest forest conservation challenge of our time. Um, there's a known solution, but to solve it, we really have to understand it. And there's a lot to understand. So my goal today is to give you a broader understanding of this large issue that is causing you know, so much environmental harm. Um, I, I bring to this discussion a rather broad perspective because unlike many natural resource professionals who are restricted to a particular site or a particular state, I've had the good fortune to travel among many states in the Northeast and get paid for it. And most recently with my Forest Service job, I worked throughout New England and New York. So, you know, I've been able to meet lots of people and get myself embroiled in many of these deer problem issues. So without further ado, I will... Kitty, we can't hear. It is a known fact that those working for the USDA and most of the other so-called agencies continue to make a living from promoting the slaughter of deer by using fear-mongering about ticks, vehicle accidents, and threatened understory in forests. So anyhow, the point of that is when I've gotten embroiled in some of these situations, um, even trying to state the most obvious, like I'm an expert, your forests are disintegrating, it's all because of gear, there still are deniers. And we're seeing a lot of that in current day politics, I think. Okay, I'll go down the next slide, which begins my photo album.
next. The Mama Doe is Fawn, North Smithfield, Rhode Island. Next, Deer in the Cemetery. Next, the poor fawn afflicted with thousands of ticks. The one sad story I heard from Brookhaven National Lab on Long Island is that the ticks become so bad on the fawns that the fawns become blinded by the tick infestations. Next slide, this is sort of gory, but this is a stillborn fawn. Uh, a very rare thing to find in the woods. You know, I got to it before the mammalian scavengers got to it at least and after we found this i said well its twin must be nearby and sure enough the twin jumped up so this happens not only to deer but the sheep and cattle next slide indian artifacts primitive hunters and the next slide shows the impact of modern hunters Are you with me, Kitty? Yes, I'm with you, Tom. Okay, so I'll move away from that. Next slide shows the yellow lady slipper before and after. The next slide shows American ginseng, which is quite a cash crop and it's legal to harvest in Vermont and New York with a pruner. The next slide shows American chestnut. And look at those sprouts at the bottom. Deer browsing is the final nail in the coffin for this tree species. Because up until now, without deer, it could continually sprout new sprouts if the blight killed it back. But now the sprouts cannot survive, and so we're losing even sapling and pole-sized timber of chestnut in our woods. Next slide. Uh, this is where deer were munching on white pine and hemlock in Stowe, Massachusetts. So when they start to eat unpalatable plants like white pine, that's an indicator you've got a problem. This is a low bush blueberry, which should be two feet tall and producing flowers and fruit. Um, I measured all the stems of this. Long Island site, and the average was like four or five inches. And the functional role of a plant like this is gone. It may still be there in the forest, but it doesn't produce flowers and fruit. So its functional role is gone. Next, the sign into the orchard. Next. Many towns restrict hunting for safety reasons, towns that are so congested by suburban sprawl. At least Westford allows it with written permission. Many towns don't allow firearm hunting. The next slide shows this vegetable. Kitty, do you know what that vegetable is? Um, I'm not sure. What is that? I don't see it very often. It's a kohlrabi. But this is from Western Massachusetts, where they have an active farming program on town lands. And the deer cause thousands of dollars of damage each year, even though they've spent thousands of dollars fencing these areas, they still get in. And this is a huge concern on Long Island, because Eastern Long Island is the most productive agricultural county in New York. Next slide shows all these weird arbor vitaes. And this isn't even one quarter of them. I came across this area in eastern New York, and it always puzzled me until I, someone told me what's going on. I mean, there are thousands of these. Each arbor vitae has a, you know, a five foot fence around it. And it cracked me up to learn that when this hydro dam was built, uh, Blenheim Gilboa Dam was built. One of the environmental impacts was loss of a certain amount of deer habitat. So the power company said, as mitigation, we will plant thousands of arborvitaes. So what you see here is 
mitigation for loss of deer habitat. Next slide. And then I arrived on the scene of this car accident. The lady was very distraught. Photographed the dead animal too. It ruined her day. And this damage wasn't nearly as bad. Next slide. The passenger in this car in Lincoln, Rhode Island, she was in her 70s and was injured quite badly. And the deer was in the back seat still kicking when the police arrived. And that is one big deer. Right, Scott? Okay, next slide. The roadkill doe. I mean, one way or another, if these deer aren't hunted, this is a major cause of mortality, and it's totally wasteful and tragic and costs money, and it traumatizes or injures people. Next slide. These are black vultures. You know, I thought of fighting with them to get that deer carcass for myself, but they were too scary looking, so I let them have it. Next slide. Not all the deer hit die on the spot. I came across this I came across this buck with two broken legs on the side of the animal that got hit by the car. And it was a pitiful sight and I did the right thing by putting it out of its misery. But uh, many of these deer are counted. They'll run into the woods and then die. Next slide shows me and my buddy. We had a pretty good day. Of course, we didn't kill all of those deer, but we killed probably half of them. Um, this is from Rhinebeck, New York. Next slide. This is a posted sign, and it's from an Audubon property in New York, uh, in Vermont. Next slide, there's my son with his giant buck. When he shot it, I said, this is not a buck of a lifetime. That's a buck of four lifetimes. Because it's bigger than anything I or his grandfather or his great-grandfather ever got. It's a lucky little putter. Okay, y'all still with me? Next slide, some deer impacts. <coughs> yep. Oh, okay. Some deer impacts and forests. Uh, that's what we like to see, right? Lovely understory, tree saplings, herbaceous plants. And much of this flush of growth occurs in May, just when the does are giving birth and begin lactating. So it's a time of plenty for deer. Unfortunately, next slide. You know, the picture on the right of that small explosion, that's from Kittery, Maine. And uh, Walter Carson and I did a little study there because the landowner has about 50 of these fences he put up as long as 20 years ago to protect lady slippers. But we were fascinated by all the other plant life that was protected there, too. <laughs> Just a few things about the word browse. It can be a verb or it can be a noun. So sometimes it's confusing how it's being used. So you could use it in a sentence like this. The deer was browsing through the forest looking for tender browse to browse. So some concepts. Next slide. Facts are never uniform. Some are more preferred than others. Deer affect the composition, structure, and future trajectories of forests. Um, um so, sorry, excuse me, Tom. Which slides are you on right now? It says important concepts. Oh, okay. All right. I got you. Thank you. Okay. Um, towards the bottom there, the point that deer diminish biotic resistance is a very important concept because when most of the native plants are coming, that opens the door to invasive plant profusion. And for years when people were, you know, vilifying invasive plants, they would show pictures of these deer-impacted woods that I recognize as totally hammered by deer. 
and they would be blaming the stilt grass instead of the deer. So if you just fence an area that's infested with stilt grass or um, garlic mustard, those two species quickly disappear because you've restored biotic resistance. So Vern Blossy out at Cornell, he said something that I love to repeat. He said, your time is better spent hunting than weeding. Okay, next slide. Here's that word recalcitrant understories. And you can see hay scented fern and huckleberry. In relatively short period of time, the forests of eastern Long Island are becoming heathlands. So the oaks that die back are not being replaced, and all that terrain, and we're seeing it, you know, very clearly now, it's turning into huckleberry heathlands. Um, with the hay-scented fern, if you got rid of, rid of the deer tomorrow, it might take 100 years for any tree seedling to get established in that thick stuff. Next slide, forest disintegration. That's another good word that I've coined, and we all have to use it. Um, there's no resilience anymore. So on the left, when this 500-acre fire occurred in 2015, it just hastened the disintegration of that forest. Okay, and the Grace Estate over there. Next slide. A few words about wildlife management in North America. Uh, some quotes from the greats. Nature has introduced great variety, but man has displayed a passion for simplifying it. He undoes the built-in checks and balances. So that's what we're dealing with, the landscape lacking, you know, sufficient wild predation. Aldo Leopold, a thing is right when it tends to preserve the integrity, stability, and beauty of the biotic community. It is wrong when it tends otherwise. So this is the famous land ethic. In that phrase, you see the word right, and you see the word wrong. And that's the land ethic. That's what should guide all natural resource professionals. But it doesn't, and there's a lot of hypocrisy out there in terms of land management. I had the good fortune in my, as an undergraduate, my advisor was an Aldo Leopold student. And so we heard so much about him. Our students used to joke that we have to bow to Wisconsin every morning. And in recent years, I've corresponded with you know, members of the uh, Leopold family, Estella, the lone surviving daughter of Aldo Leopold, and his daughter-in-law, Lynn Leopold came to my talk in Ithaca. I was very pleased about that. And I actually hunted on her property. Um, and also her grandson, all those grandson works in Wisconsin. Um, so you can see that fertilary butterfly on the Canada lily. Uh, that, that's what we want to see. But Canada lily was the first plant to go at Middlesex Bells, north of Boston, when the deer herd was just building up. So, um, you know, there's a tremendous craze about pollinators, right? Everyone is planting pollinating plant, uh, bee plants and nectar plants in their yards, and their whole universe is their backyard. But very few people are thinking about the fact that there are very few flowers in the woods. So we need to extend that passion for pollinator conservation to the woods and not just someone's backyard. Um, Okay, next slide, Gifford Pinchot. I wish I could come back 100 years from now and see my trees. You know, he was the first director of the Forest Service. His mansion in Pennsylvania yeah. is the National Historic Site. The woods you see on the left are what surround his fenced-in mansion. The Forest Service spent thousands of dollars building a deer fence around the estate grounds. And, but beyond it, here's this mess. So when I wrote my trip report in 2006, I suggested that Gifford would have rather we put the fence around the forest. Of course, that was met with total silence, total crickets, because I was delving into an area that they did not want to deal with. 
the deer issue. Okay, next slide. Gary Alt was worked for the Pennsylvania Game Commission. He tried for years to try to get hunters to be more involved with management to shoot more does. And he describes it as one of the greatest mistakes in the history of wildlife management. He had to quit his job, and when he would go to meetings, he'd wear bulletproof vests and have a law enforcement person with him. Next slide. So, in terms of what wildlife management or any natural resource management, there are these three realms of a socio ecological system plant, animals, and people. And you can see where they intersect. So traditionally, the foresters worked at the intersection of plants and people, forest management. The wildlifers work in their intersection of wildlife and people. And researchers may have been involved in studying plant herbivore relationships. Um, but to really accomplish this, we need to all meet in the middle, ecosystem management. And that causes some turf issues. So when I start questioning wildlife management practices and whatever, I get pushback like, hey, stick to your own turf. If you're a forester, you're a botanist. You're not supposed to tell us how to manage deer. Um, so ideally, you need a multidisciplinary approach to this. And you need cooperation um, to work in that middle. Uh, it's much easier not to work in that middle dealing with people, as I found out. Okay, next slide. So in North America, which includes Canada and Mexico, of course, they're guided by this model of wildlife conservation. Um, I'll just say a few things about it. You know, they want to restrict or limit, you know, market hunting or using wildlife for value, but you can sell pelts and hides and deer feet and deer antlers and such. Um, but you can't sell deer meat because it's not government inspected. Um, so that's a real drawback. Although it's an interesting satellite, you may hear venison donation programs, which are quite popular. And for a town trying to control its deer, you know, what do you do with the dead ones? Well, you donate them to soup kitchens and you can do that legally under the good Samaritan laws so you are held harmless if you donate venison to poor people which in itself has some issues I have in the back of my mind um, but that is why one can donate venison but not um, sell it um, it can be sold in New Zealand and parts of Europe and in New Newfoundland, it's legal for a person to sell his or her moose meat to restaurants or processing plants. And it's just a free permit that's involved and you report to the provincial government. Um, the number seven, democracy. I mean, these animals belong to all people, held in public trust. So we all have, should have the same opportunity to harvest them. Um, but there are some exceptions, like in Vermont, when the legislature told Fish and Wildlife that they would not shoot does anymore during the rifle season. Why? Because hunters squawked, they went to the legislators, and the legislators told Fish and Wildlife, no, you're not to manage this scientifically. You ought to listen to what we say. So a poor hunter in Vermont, so a poor hunter in Vermont may have a not allowed to shoot an antlerless deer unless he or she goes and buys a muzzleloader or an expensive hunting bow. So I pointed that out to them as a violation of this. And especially during these economic times, um, they should be making every effort to make this democratic to everyone, um, at least even through a lottery or whatever, some chance to harvest the resource that belongs to them and not just to the rich hunters, right? Okay, next slide. Money is so central to, to everything and state wildlife management agencies are quite unique in state government. 
that long ago they got their their own pots of money, and the states were very happy to say, okay, you're more or less self-funded. You're part of state government, but um, you're sort of self-funding. Um, much of that was through this Wildlife Restoration Act, that at the wholesale level, 11% tax is applied to guns, ammo, and hunting bows. They didn't know how to value arrows, so they charged 50 cents per shaft. And also, look at that. There's a 10% excise tax on handguns, which the proceeds go into wildlife restoration. And um, you know, very soon after Obama was elected, there was a huge increase in the tax money available through this program because people were panicking and buying guns like crazy. So it's kind of weird to think that, you know, gangsters with handguns are helping wildlife management. Um, the money is given out by this formula, the number of licenses sold in land area, and if you're a tiny state like Rhode Island, you get the fair minimum. 8% um, of the tax money is kept for administration, and just some statistics, Connecticut received almost $2 million in fiscal year 2019. From 34,000 hunters, whereas New York received 17 million from over half a million licensed hunters. So where's the money coming from? And it's not only this, but you know, there's license fees and tax checkoffs and license plates. So they've been real innovative to try to buy new pots of money. Next, white-tailed deer overabundance. It has a clear meaning only when placed in a specific context. Now, at first you might think, well, if there's too many deer, most people know that, like that sign above from East Hampton. That's the number of roadkill that, uh, that the highway people actually picked up and disposed of. And each roadkill, they got a GPS point, so they mapped them. And just about every bit of road in East Hampton has dots of deer collisions over the years. This year's sign has 621, so they're not making much progress. Also shown in the map is Plum Island, which is not far from Fisher's Island. And Plum Island is fascinating because they tolerate the zero deer there. So over, they are overabundant when there's one deer on the island, which is then hunted down and shot. And the reason being is that there's a very sophisticated animal disease laboratory there. And in that laboratory, they have dreaded disease organisms like hoof and mouth disease. So we did a tour of the property a few years ago. And the thinking is, if a terrorist, and it's managed by Homeland Security. So if there's a terrorist act that breaches that facility or some major hurricane that destroys it and releases that pathogen, hoof and mouth disease, to the environment. And then if there's a deer on the island that contracts it, and then if that deer swims back to the mainland of Long Island and spreads it to other deer and then to cattle, and there's a lot of ifs there, right? But that would essentially destroy America's beef industry because it's, in, it's not allowed to import beef from any country that has hoof and mouth disease. So anyhow, if a deer swims out to Plum Island, Wildlife Services is called to hunt it down and shoot it. And when we were there, we did see some evidence of a few deer. They have security cameras set up you know, for other reasons, but occasionally they'll detect deer on that. Okay, and again, the consensus determination in South Hole, which is the North Fork, the, the town reached, had been hunting on town lands, but they reached out to the large property owners recently, and 79% of them gave permission for additional bow hunters. So that increased their hunting land base from 300 acres to 1,000. And you know, when I've given talks at South Hole, we had a room full of 300 people, and they were demanding of urgent change. Okay, next slide. I think I'm rambling a little bit. This is just 
to make you aware of this concept in the social sciences of wicked problems, which I think the dear problem falls into. You know, the strong um, moral, ethical, political values and dimensions. If you solve one part of it, you create a problem elsewhere. So just a little point to you know, learn about wicked problems. Next is my recipe for deer overabundance too. Start with a prolific prey species, not many wild predators. You've improved the habitat in suburbia and elsewhere by logging, creating early successful conditions. You have fewer hunting opportunities. You get declining hunters and spoiled hunters, who in many cases, you know, pulled off to that big buck and aren't really helpful in reducing the herd. You still have restricted hunting regulations, timid NGOs, and that's one of the saddest things I come across in conservation groups that manage absolutely devastated lands are still too timid to take the bull by the horns and deal with it. They would rather remain willfully blind because they don't want to upset their board members, their constituency by promoting hunting. And so we're trying to turn the tide there. We've been somewhat successful. Um, one problem is that some of the NGOs like Mass Audubon or the trustees of reservations, uh, they'll make a big to-do about allowing bow hunting on certain properties. And we all know that's not going to do anything to solve the problem. But that's where they quit. They don't want to go the next step and pressure the state to give them a deer depredation permit or something that's really needed. Um, okay, so a bunch of stuff goes into this too. Again, the funding model is problematic because most of these agencies are so dependent on the hunters who have a big say in how deer are managed. As we saw in Vermont, if the hunters think too many does are being shot, they complain to their uh, legislators. And there's a paucity of research and mitigation funding. You know, I saw that in the Forest Service. All the money went to invasive problem, or pest insects and diseases because the public is 100% against emerald ash borer and, and oak wilt disease. And so the Forest Service funds every state's forest health protection program. And it's a very comfortable situation. And they do not say the D word. Because if you were to say, oh, we're going to try to address this deer problem where 75% of the people are against it. OK, next slide. You all with me? Yes, Tom. OK, the modern hunter. You know, hunting, especially deer hunting, is big business. And, you know, people are quite malleable and can be influenced by what um, the advertisers put forth. So this is the current direction of hunting. You know, they'll try to sell you all kinds of gizmos and use pretty girls. I mentioned earlier that the only thing missing from this photograph is a political bumper sticker. Next. So one consequence of this being deluged by industry about big bucks, I and mean, you're only a man if you can shoot a big buck and brag about it, is that there's this rift between trophy hunting and meat hunting. And it bothers me a lot because trophy hunting has a negative connotation to most people. But if you say you're a meat hunter or a locavore, there's more acceptance of that. But so the more that the public views hunters as trophy hunters, I think the worse it is for, for hunting. Uh, the state of Vermont published these three catalogs of their game laws. Um, they use photographs from Kansas, Tennessee, and New Hampshire. Three years in a row, they featured big antlered bucks as if there was nothing else in Vermont to hunt. This year's issue is called the Modern Hunter, and it shows this phony photo of two men all decked out in the latest gear. And it's because there's a conflict of interest within the 
the positive that I pointed out to the commissioner. We'll see how that goes. Um, so in some states, like Vermont and parts of New York, there's things called antler point restrictions. So there's enough sentiment for big racks that they say, we have to stop shooting this lesser buck so they can grow to be big ones. You know, thereby appeasing this trophy hunting group and stepping on the right of the, the poor hillbilly who just wants venison and is told, no, you can't shoot that spike buck because these rich dudes who like the antlers won't let you and the state legislatures won't let you. So we need to get away from that. Um, but it's very hard because we're all influenced by what the advertisers and the agencies are pushing. Big freaking bucks. Next picture. Okay, let's see. Twelve case studies. I just picked these out at random, and again, it's because I met a lot of these good people fighting these fights, and each story is quite a bit different. Um, so, just to give you a flavor of what goes on, I think Dr. Williams could speak quite eloquently about his experience in Reading, Connecticut, where they tried to do high-level research on deer and ticks, which involved calling the herd down. And I think they met with some formidable resistance from hunters who called their legislators. Right, Scott? <laughs> OK, so anyhow, here's the story. Next slide. I'll start with Monhegan. It's a success story because initially the deer were brought way out there, they caused problems, people were getting Lyme disease, and they voted, no, you brought them here, you get rid of them. So they extirpated the deer totally, and tick-borne disease went to practically zero. It was orchestrated by Tony DiNicola of White Buffalo, and Tony relayed an interesting story about trying to get the last about getting the last few deer, because it's easy to get the first hundred or so. He waited till there was a snowfall and then dropped everything and went and started trailing the deer. And that's how he found uh, three together and took them out. Cayuga Heights is also a success story. It went through over a decade of you know lawsuits and trying this, and Cornell would be surgically sterilizing the female deer and all this stuff. Um, so what finally worked, again, they hired Tony and White Buffalo. They had been culling the deer over bait at night, but the state said, no, you, you have to be 300 feet from any road. And in this developed community, that wasn't possible. So they resorted to capture and euthanize. So they would guard the animals and then inject them. Problem solved. Staten Island, New York, <laughs> you know, half a million people live there. I spoke there about 10 years ago when there were about 30 deer on the whole island, but there was concern by us. Uh, there were real problems that in New York City, it's not legal to hunt, which is different than saying no firearm shooting. It just says no hunting allowed in New York City. So Staten Island is the borough of parks, um, you know, beautiful natural lands, which were beautiful 10 years ago, but they're overrun. And so White Buffalo and Tony DiNicola proposed what initially what seemed like the truly outlandish idea was be to capture the male deer and give them quick vasectomies. And solely over time, that would reduce the population. And some experts said, no, you can never capture all the male deer. But with 6.6 .6 million They've been pretty darn close to it, and they are seeing reductions. And I see it now as an absolute stroke of genius that he went this approach. Because if you look 10 years down the road, this problem will have solved itself, partly because you don't have infusion of new deer. It is an island, so you don't have to worry about immigration of new deer. Uh, I got involved with it when there was like a little rift between the borough president, uh, James Otto, and Mayor de Blasio. De Blasio didn't want the 
deer killed for obvious reasons. You have this huge human population that would freak out. Whereas Otto said, you know, if you have them captured, why not just kill them? Had they done the, the lethal routine, they'd be doing that forever, routinely. And you would stir up all this negative um, and negative reaction from the public. So, you know, wish Tony luck. And I think this was, again, a stroke of genius that in a few years, the problem may be solved. Number four, Truman's Berg, a very successful hunt, shooting deer at night through a deer depredation permit. Truman's Berg is near Ithaca, where all these smarties are, and they know how to manage deer. Um, so that's a good model. Hunters often go on weekends only and shoot the deer at night over bait. And you know, I commend New York DEC for giving out more and more of these deer depredation permits, which are like nuisance permits, right? An, an airport will get one if it's a deer type of fence and it has to be shot for safety reasons. So, you know, this is one of the only tools that people have uh, to control the deer. Um, again, the food is donated. How am I doing for time, Kitty? Um, do we have about 20 minutes left? Okay. Shelter Island, New York, it sits between the North and South Forks. I've hunted there for like 30 years in a row. I used to work for the Nature Conservancy. Um, we would shoot about 120 to 150 deer per year on 2,000 acres which is a lot. But the problem dates back to the early 1900s. 1916, the, the farmers on the island were complaining that these escaped deer from a mansion were wrecking havoc. So they tried this massive deer roundup and it attracted movie cameras and sightseers from all over. It was this big fiasco and they chased the deer from one end of the island to the other and the deer ran in the ocean and Part of the fiasco. But finally, you know, they do have deer depredation permits and they're spending a lot of their own money, even these wealthy communities, and they can fork over enough to maybe hire one person. Um, but all these towns are left to themselves to fund these efforts. Um, for years on Shelter Island, they had this nice arrangement where they would pay the two butchers on the island to process the meat. And the meat was placed in a town freezer at the town transfer station. So because town money went into paying the butchers, any resident could take deer meat out of the freezer. It was a nice system. Another way around it is that they had two good hunters obtain their nuisance wildlife control permits or licenses. So now the town, instead of of bounties for deer, they could pay these licensed professionals to harvest the deer. All right, next slide. Moving into number six, Islesboro. Um, they are in limbo. A whole bunch of deer. It's a big island. The hunter said, "No, we don't want outsiders. We can do it. We can shoot a hundred per year." But they fell way short of that. Um, the, some people proposed a firearm hunt, which was shut down, and their former deer reduction committee was disbanded. So that whole town is in one boat. Total failure. Brain Tree Mass is very highly developed, but it has some beautiful natural land. So I've been monitoring stuff there for 10 years, anticipating some hunting to occur. So the Conservation Commission proposed, they proposed it, but then it was shot down. And it's an interesting reason why it was shot down. Um, the biggest property could only accommodate a few hunters. And one of the reasons is that Massachusetts having a 500 foot setback distance for archery which is really dumb at the same setback distance for gun shooting. Um, other states like New York reduced it greatly 
and Connecticut has never had a legal setback distance for archery. But in Massachusetts, they maintain this, and each house eliminates 18 acres of habitat. If you draw a circle, 500 foot radius around a house, so it doesn't take many houses along even you know remote areas to prevent archery hunting, which is quite safe. The point that I made to the Conservation Commission is it, it, all these towns who consider this issue only allow it if it is perceived to provide some benefit to the town's forest or benefit to the habitat. And that is totally wrong in my idea because these deer belong to all of us. A hunter who buys a license is legally entitled to harvesting one of his or her animals. And by what right does a town have to say that I can't go and harvest one of my deer off of my town property unless you deem it valuable to the forest? So there shouldn't be that criteria. And they always fall back on safety, and, and that's totally not an issue. Uh, I don't know if you see the fine point here, but only hunters are being made to state how their recreation benefits, and they can only recreate if their activity provides some benefit. And that's totally wrong. It's like asking a dog walker, well, how is this going to help the trails? Um, anyhow. It's a sorry situation. I've seen all kinds of deer and brain tree, and it's very sad. Number eight, Hastings on Hudson. You can see that map. It's, again, very densely populated. Many houses have deer fencing around them, like a Fort Apache. They have one town property, Hastings Hillside Woods, um, which is like Dog Walk Central and the deer cave. And like culling the deer over bait. It's just not an option because you can't get 300 feet away from most any road or house there. So they went the immunocontraception way seven years ago. They started it, and they're seeing some reduction, which is good to see. Um, but it's a very expensive and time-consuming proposition, and this is an open system as opposed to an island. So there's always going to be deer recruitment into this area. So the long-term prognosis is not good, um, especially to reduce the deer to a level that the forest can tolerate and that people can tolerate. But, you know, it's shown some effort, some success with, with a huge effort. Okay, let's go to number nine, Block Island. Deer were introduced there quite late, 1967. I think seven deer were brought there. Um, one interesting thing, and I remember going black, black lighting, spotlighting for deer in the 80s, and the deer were all over the place then. But through private sources, they acquired money to give hunters $150 per deer, but it's not a bounty, because bounties are sort of illegal. So they would pay $150 per deer tail turned in. So one can still buy and sell deer tails, which are used in fly tying operations, right? And get 50 cents for one. But here's a person who in the town was paying $150 per deer tail. Um, it didn't work. There's all these problems. You know, the people on the island have a certain mentality. Um, also, the state of Rhode Island still, even on Black Island, enforces the two buck limit for a hunter. So, because bucks are considered trophy animals and have to be stockpiled, when you're trying to cull the herd on, on Black Island, the state still only allows you to shoot two antlered deer. Um, they don't have a, a, a butcher on the island or a way to deal with them if they were to be donated, um, but then a group out of uh, Providence has offered to take the whole deer. Um, a group is from Southeast Asia. Okay, num number 10 is uh, Hanover, New Hampshire, you know where Dartmouth is. 
like a lot of these towns with natural land, your population built up. And I just want to give a shout out to Barbara McElroy, who just turned 80 years old. But she was a tireless crusader, and the town pressured the state to come up with a DMAP program, which is the first in New Hampshire. Massachusetts, of course, does not have DMAP because we're so backwards. But anyhow, it's been quite successful. The high schools are real enthusiastic, and they've really knocked the deer herd down there, all because of Barbara McElroy and the fact that New Hampshire Fishing Game um, was flexible enough to do this. And over Mass, it was the local firefighter who pushed this issue at town meeting. And you'd be quoted in the paper, you never in a thousand years would I propose something that he thought was remotely dangerous to anybody. Even still, Jane Anthony, the science teacher, said she didn't want to get an arrow through her heart when going through the woods behind the middle school. Well, it turns out Jane Anthony, the middle school teacher, became a great advocate for deer herd reduction, um, involving her sixth grade students going out there and monitoring twigs and shrubs. And uh, so people can come around. The hunters were great. They paid for closures. And a dolphin who runs the program, this is not buck hunters. Any deer you see, you shoot. Um, unfortunately, the vegetation has been kind of slow to respond. And finally, this is not a municipality, but you know, out in the boonies of New York, uh, there are these big state forests, and um, this was the state first state forest in New York to get DMAP, Deer Management Assistance Programs. So as many as three, four free tags could be given to a hunter. And the density wasn't high. You know, I've been monitoring it for many years. I was brought in when the DMAP began. Um, this year, the forest just had a meeting with the hunters who asked to meet with them about some of their concerns that they were seeing fewer deer. Um, you know, I've hunted deer opening weekends for the past five years because I want to gauge the hunting intensity and the hunting attitude. The hunting attitude is definitely turned against this program. There are people who get the tags intentionally not, and not fill them. There are people who refuse to shoot those. Um, so you, there's certain limits when you're dealing with hunter mentality and the fact that they all want big bucks. Um, but let's see how it goes. My son and I, we love it there. We don't get a deer every year, but um, it's a real quality hunt. Ah, solving the problem. Well, my overall goal was to introduce you to this broad issue and its many dimensions from funding to hunter attitudes to agency philosophy. So we all need insight. We all need empathy. I sound like President Biden. And we have to have empathy to the deer. Remember that crippled deer being hit by the car? We need empathy for people suffering from tick-borne diseases. Action. And you know that's one of the uplifting things of my work over the years, to see people in communities really um, being bald and in some cases organizing. Um, unless they organize, I don't think much action will come of it. And finally, perseverance. So, some information sources. I'll just mention the two. Deer Friendly, if you Google that, you can find the latest news articles about deer from any state in the country. And it's updated periodically. Community Deer Advisor is something Cornell came up with so that communities don't have to reinvent the wheel. There's good advice and good case studies there. Hi, uh, excuse me, Tom, sorry to interrupt. I'm not sure which case study are you on right now. Um, I think I'm oh, on. Okay, I'll go back. Yes. I was on solving the problem. Oh. Okay, all right. Got okay. you. So I'm kind of on the solving the problem for requirements. Yeah, so yeah, I talked about insight, empathy, action, oh. and perseverance. Then I went to the next slide. Information sources. The deer friendly, I highly recommend it. If you just like to peruse what's in the news. The community deer advisor, that's something to help communities not reinvent the wheel. Mm -hmm. um, one of the 
Further down the Washtenaw County Citizens for Ecological Balance, they amassed an amazing amount of information about deer and related things. Okay, so I'll go to this quote from Jim Sturba. This is the final paragraph of his book, Nature Wars. So maybe I'm stealing his thunder here, but helping modern Americans understand and accept the need for human oversight isn't an easy task. It involves reconnecting people to their ecosystems again, getting Americans outdoors and re-engaged in the land and the natural world in ways that, to put it bluntly, get dirt under the fingernails, blood in the hands, and even a wood splinter or two in the kneecaps or butts. And, and finally, from this paper published by Riley in 2003, um, as professionals, we all need to get involved with this. I mean, we all have something to contribute. So no other area in wildlife management will require this kind of integrative thinking to come up with these solutions. That little fawn is in East Hampton, New York. You can see the browse line on the forest. So thank you. I'm done. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much for the uh, very uh, interesting uh, talk and a lot of pictures. Uh, at this moment, I think we have some few questions from the audience. I will let um, um, Dr. William to uh, come up and, and, and ask questions from the audience. Sure. Uh, we had one that I dealt with was what does DMAP stand for? And that's uh, the Deer Management Assistant Program. And the other question for you, Tom, was um, could you address the vasectomy versus killing of the deer? I didn't follow why vasectomy would be a longer term solution aside from the human opposition issues in Staten Island. Scott, I didn't quite catch that. Could you repeat it slowly? It said, could you address um, the vasectomy versus the killing of deer on Staten Island and why vasectomy is a longer term solution than the lethal management. I caught part of that. Lethal management as a long-term solution or not a long-term? Yeah, okay. Um, um, uh, Tom, let, let me uh, repeat that. Uh, could you address the vasectomy vs. killing deer? I did not follow why vasectomy would be a long-term solution aside from human a position issue in Staten Island? Yeah, I think I caught part of that. Um, maybe I'll hit on a little bit of it. You know, for 11,000 years, it's believed that Homo sapiens was the major predator of white-tailed deer in North America. Um, with suburban sprawl, we basically vacated that responsibility, and so the deer herds built up tremendously. Um, there's philosophical issues about the taking of another life or hunting. Um, you know, I see it as, you know, perfectly natural and that we evolved as the greatest predator the planet has ever seen. And when we teamed up with the dog 30,000 years ago, we became an absolute unstoppable force. I think for the million years of our evolution, if we hadn't become the top predator, our brains wouldn't have developed. So everyone who's very smart in the world owes that to the fact that our evolution required us to outsmart up with gain. Um, in terms of, you know, personally, I think the locavore movement is viewed quite favorably, whereas, you know, commercial production of meat in slaughterhouses is a huge energy sink. So probably rambling again, I didn't hear the whole question. That's, I, I think you covered it. Um, and I don't see any more questions. So thank you, Tom. I know we had some challenges, but um, and I know the audience um, was you showed some challenges that we have with um, deer and deer management. And I appreciate you coming on. Oh, um, hold on, Tom and Scott. I think we have another question uh, just pop up. 
uh, from Tim. He said, is any kind of fencing effective? For example, on a uh, one acre lot half bordering wood. I mean, let me post that into the uh, chat section. Hold on. So Scott can see. Hold on one moment. I will. All right. Okay. Oh, I see. I the question is, um, is any kind of fencing effective, for example, on a one acre lot, half bordering the woods, bordering the woods? Yes, fencing is can be effective, um, but it needs to be minimally eight feet, preferably 10 feet high, and it needs to be um, staked to the ground. Um, deer can jump over eight feet if there's something desirable in inside for them to get at but they're much more apt to go underneath. So um, just make sure it's staked to the ground and there's no place they can sneak underneath. Uh, okay. one, other, one other thing about deer fencing that I've seen, you know, having put up these deer enclosures, if you're enclosing a small area, you don't need a tall fence. So if it's just, you know, 30 feet by 30 feet, the deer will walk around it. They won't be motivated to jump inside it necessarily. Um, right. Yep, I agree. Relatively low fencing around small areas, but if you're fencing an acre or two, and it is true that deer will crawl under fences. Uh, one landowner on the south hold, you know, he discovered that to his dismay, and now he puts a string of barbed wire right along the base of his fence. <laughs> Okay, I think that is going to wrap it up. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, audience members. And um, thanks for uh, getting through this challenging time with these challenging issues we had with this uh, audio and video. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, and again, sorry for the, the technical difficulties, but you know, feel free to contact me one way or another you know, if any of you are really interested. Um, I'd love to hear from you. and. As I said, I'm working on a book on this subject, so I can use as much fodder as I can get. <laughs> so thanks very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Bye. Yeah, bye, Kitty. Okay, it's ending.